Hello, everyone. It has been great two days and uh, to talk about regulation at the end of the conference. I hope everyone is still um, have the energy to listen to us. Um, first, we got a high-profile experience panel. I'll let them introduce themselves. Thanks, Vaughn. Uh, my name is Daniel Stabile. I'm the co-chair of the digital asset practice group at the law firm Winston and Strawn. And then in terms of my extracurricular life, I've been teaching a class on blockchain regulation here in Miami at the University of Miami Law School since 2018. Hi, everyone. I'm V. Lee. I'm a partner and the head of regulatory and policy at Bain Capital Crypto. Before that, I was a deputy GC at a crypto startup called WorldCoin. And before that, I spent almost six years at the SEC uh, in the enforcement division. And my name is Kristen Smith. I'm the executive director of Blockchain Association, which is a Washington, D.C.-based trade association. We work on public policy issues on behalf of our 105 uh, member organizations. Um, and so today, that mostly means working on legislation, uh, oftentimes engaging uh, with the courts uh, as well. But uh, we also continue to educate regulators, policymakers, and the administration. So I think um, I've heard at least two dozen times of FTX in, the, in this conference. Even before that, um, whether regulation will come to this industry or not, I don't think is a question. It's about how we regulate and who regulate it, which agency regulate it. Um, and also, uh, a lot of panelists already said we should separate criminal act um, between regulation and criminal act. As the mayor said, the regulation regulates what you do, but in every, under every circumstance, there are always some bad people will do some bad things and will punish them afterwards. So after FD, FTX incidents, uh, what is your view on our future for regulation coming to this industry? I'll let you guys. Okay, sure, oh, yeah, I'll start. So, I mean, even before FTX and this series of bankruptcy events um, of major exchanges and lenders, the financial services regulatory environment in the United States has been famously complex. You have a series of different federal regulators, um, many of whom are vying for jurisdiction in this area. And then on top of that, you have the states. Um, so for traditional financial institutions, trad banks and broker dealers, um, they spend a lot of money with in-house legal and external legal counsel trying to navigate the regulatory environment. With this new asset class of digital assets, um, the complexities have just magnified and there really has been an extraordinary um, turf war that's playing out publicly mainly between the SEC and the CFTC as to which regulator will have primary authority um, over this space. There's legislation percolating um, in Congress right now that would help to sort of sort out that jurisdictional morass. Um, at the same time, you have the SEC taking enforcement actions um, with fairly aggressive positions in terms of what types of um, asset, how to classify different assets. Um, with FTX, I, I think that um, a few things will come of this. First of all, every policymaker and legislator in, in Washington, I think now um, is focused on this space. I think we heard from Senator Lummis yesterday at this conference that her worst fears that there would be a knee-jerk reaction by Congress to sort of put a moratorium on this industry space have not been realized, which is a good thing. And the question is, were we really focusing on the right things previously? Because the securities regulations really focus more on um, disclosures to customers and those types of concerns, but I think um, and one thing we can talk about together on this panel is in the wake of FTX, were those the right areas of concern or are there other aspects that the regulators and lawmakers should be concerned with? 
So I'll just say briefly, I think um, you know, it's important to remember with respect to FTX and also some of the blowups that we saw happen earlier this year, like with Celsius and 3AC and Voyager, that these you know, companies were engaged in what were essentially traditional banking or broker dealer or you know, traditional financial services. Um, they were just unregulated, right? So they were engaged in things like lending um, and trading and things like that, uh, but they're just, they're like Daniel was saying, there still aren't any regulations at the federal level that clearly apply to these types of crypto platforms. Um, and so I think, you know, situations like FTX and, and these other collapses that we've seen this year just really underscore the need for action at the federal level when it comes to these centralized custodial um, platforms. And I think a lot of the things that, you know, Congress can and should do are pretty straightforward common sense things, right? Like safeguarding customer assets and um, prohibiting companies from intermingling their assets with customer assets and then using those ask assets in really risky ways. Just really common sense, straightforward things like that I think are really needed. And unfortunately, I think one issue is that Congress has been trying to do too much meaning they're trying to regulate the entire space. And of course, that's a lot harder. It takes time. There are a lot of interests and stakeholders um, involved. But I think what they should do is focus on some of these riskiest activities and pass common sense regulations quickly. Yeah, no, I think V is absolutely right. The, the key uh, to getting good regulation done is there will need to be a need to focus. Um, I think you know, the challenging thing with FTX International and its its failure is not that this was a failure of crypto, but this was a this was a fraud problem. Um, they, you know, violated their own terms of service. They took customer funds and moved them over to their, uh, you know, sister trading entity. These are activities that were probably illegal in the jurisdiction where they were regulated and would be illegal had they been headquartered here. So, you know, from my perspective, we don't see this as a fail of US federal regulation. Um, that being said, I think if we had a better federal regulatory framework in the United States, particularly around centralized exchanges, that would encourage more investment uh, and development and, and more of these companies to headquarter here in the US. And so I think the big challenge is going to be, can Congress focus in on where the actual problems are? Can we find a way to get dollar back stablecoin legislation? Can we find a way to uh, regulate the underlying spot markets without going and trying to apply those same regulations to the decentralized finance space? Because that is a fundamentally different thing. And so I think that, you know, I look at things in sort of the short term, the medium term, and the long term. In the short term, between now and January 3rd, when the new Congress is sworn in, the, the goal and, and what we're working on at Blockchain Association is to make sure no legislation happens. I think the fact that we're having multiple congressional hearings on FTX starting tomorrow um, in the Senate Agriculture Committee is a good sign because I think the US Congress should be trying to figure out what happened so that they can then tailor any regulation that might make sense, even though I don't think US regulation would have stopped what happened with FTX International. Um, in the medium term, and I'm talking Q1 next year, I think it's gonna be incumbent upon the industry to educate policymakers and make sure they understand the different actors in the ecosystem because the central centralized entities have fundamentally different risks than DeFi protocols, and we need to make sure that's understood. And then going forward, it is working to make sure, you know, we keep those narrowly tailored. But I, um, you know, I think that if there is an opportunity that has come from, from this, this disaster, it is that uh, there is a lot of interest in Congress in learning about this and potentially finding a pathway forward. And so, you know, it's just going to be incumbent upon the industry to continue to work, con continue to educate, and make sure that when the timing is right, we bring the appropriate regulatory solutions to the table. Yep. Thank you. Do you want to add something? Um, sure. I, I think Kristen makes a great point about the fact that a lot of the activities here that were most sort of sorted in the FTX situation in particular occurred offshore and arguably beyond the jurisdictional reach of the United States. So I think that international cooperation on regulation, not just at a federal level to sort of harmonize the laws within this country, but on an international level is important. You know, you hear a lot about this concept of 
jurisdictional arbitrage in this space, and a lot of exchanges have a sort of bifurcated or trifurcated structure where they'll have a U.S. arm, and then they'll have arms in other jurisdictions. A lot of the activity that FTX.com was engaged in, they wouldn't be able to do in the United States, Cer certainly not without being regulated as a, you know, but by the CFTC, for example. So I think that with this asset class in particular, that's you know inherently um, global, instantaneous, 24/7 trading capabilities. It's it's extremely important to have as much international um, cooperation as we possibly can. Well, you stole my uh, next question <laughs> because I was about to ask. This is very U.S. Focus, but crypto is a truly international global industry. So I think you still stole my thunderstorm. That's fine. <laughs> so, and also for regulation, as always, I have been hearing from all three of you about being reasonable, being appropriate. We want to prevent and punish any wrongdoing, whether it's fraud, whether it's gross negligence. But on the other side, you do want to encourage innovation. You don't want to pull Web 3.0 back to Web 2 or Web 2.5. So I will give the question to V as a um, person works in regulatory uh, agency before, how do we strike the fine balance? Yeah, I, I think it's hard. I mean, I was at the SEC um, 2016 to until last year, and I think, you know, like a lot of the other agencies in the U.S. that have um, been trying to figure out how to address crypto, like how to view it, how to treat it, how to regulate it, it was confusing in the beginning, and it still is, right? But I, I think one thing that the agencies need to realize, and the SEC has not um, sort of evolved its thinking on this, in my view, is that Crypto is about so much more than what it was in 2017 when you were largely just seeing ICOs of tokens where you know a protocol or an application didn't even exist yet. Crypto, the ecosystem, has evolved so much, so much since then, and I think the regulators have not necessarily responded to that. And so I think any regulatory framework that we come up with should be, you know, it should involve uh, just because crypto now implicates so many different interests and, you know, a, a, even tokens, right, can have all sorts of functionality. Um, I mean, DeFi didn't even really exist in 2017. And so the crypto ecosystem now is so vast and it's so diverse that we need to involve a lot of different agencies. It really needs to be a whole of government approach. Um, and the regulation should be tailored to like the specific functions and the different parts of the crypto ecosystem as opposed to trying to regulate everything through like a single securities lens or something like that because I think that that would definitely hinder a lot of the innovation that we're seeing. And, and I would just add real quickly to what V was saying, from a political perspective, as we get further into Web3 and we have more applications and more everyday users, more businesses that are using these applications, the political strength of the crypto community is only going to grow. I think we're already incredibly effective at slowing down things um, from a grassroots perspective, like f slowing down regulation and legislation that we don't like from a grassroots perspective. But as we get more and more applications that are live, as we get deeper, and it becomes more obviously useful to policymakers that, oh yeah, crypto is here for good, then we'll be able to pivot and actually get those like good, positive, proactive regulatory frameworks in place. So I think, um, as, as much as we would like to have snap our fingers and have a good framework in place today, that framework is going to be better if we allow more time for the ecosystem to develop and for um, the, the policymakers who are making those decisions to understand the new innovations that are coming online. Great. So I'll give you um, each one minute. <laughs> as experienced professionals, what is your advice to the industry, to the practitioners, and to the investors. How should, how should they influence, particularly in the United States, regula regulators and lawmakers thinking? How should we make them understand the industry and make appropriate uh, regulation? 
Well, you know, there, there are opportunities to go in and, and, and see regulators. Historically, that's been sort of anathema to the traditional financial system, right? Like, you never want to go in and voluntarily approach your regulators. No good can come of that. Um, there was a period of time in which um, there was, I think, at the SEC and in other agencies, something of like an open door policy. Like, come in, educate us, explain to us what's going on. I do perceive the pendulum shifting a little bit back in the other direction because you have instances like BlockFi that apparently were talking with the regulators and then subsequently sort of got slammed with a $100 million fine between the federal regulators and the horrible. state regulators. So that's created massive disincentives for people to avail themselves of approaching their regulators, but I think you know, participating in organizations like Kristen's, talking to your regulators and lawmakers to the extent that you're comfortable doing that, um, and, you know, presenting yourselves as, you know, mature and thoughtful corporate citizens. Going in there and saying, we should have zero regulation is not gonna get a lot of traction with the regulators, but I think that a lot of regulators are very interested in having the conversation about what's the appropriate level of regulation without killing this industry or forcing it offshore. Yeah, so I, I think there are probably a lot of like entrepreneurs in this room and so, you know, I think the most important thing, one of the most important things we can do as an industry is just to keep building like really cool products and services and tools that people want and that people use and, you know, that's, that's really powerful. I think, you know, when we talk to policymakers in DC, that's what they want to hear about. They want to hear about the really real like use cases, right? And so I think it's also important though that when you're building those things, you have to do it in a way that's like safe for your users, right? Because if your users are vulnerable to things like hacks and attacks and if they're losing money, that's always gonna draw the attention of regulators. I would take take those I would say take those things really seriously, right? Like building products that are safe and secure. Um, I would echo both what Daniel and V said. Um, you know, I would say if you are a company or an organization in this space, you should come join the Blockchain Association. Um, that's that's what we're here to do. But but really, I think there's there's sort of three steps to influencing policy. We have to organize, we have to educate, and we have to activate. And the organization comes from you know working with trade organizations, or if you're an individual, following the work of Coin Center or following the work of DeFi Education Fund. These are nonprofits that are specific to supporting the technology, and um, these organizations, including Blockchain Association, can help facilitate policymaker education. We have materials, we have ways to set up introductions and and meetings, um, and get you in front of your congressman and in front of your senators. Um, and then there are moments when we need to activate. We need to let regulators know in the comment process. We need to let policymaker know, policymakers on the Hill know that we support or oppose a certain piece of legislation. And it's it's you know staying up to speed on these developments. And and when the call to action goes out to to you know make our voices heard, I think we've been incredibly effective as an ecosystem because we're used to collaborating online and we have now been able to figure out how to take that same energy and, and direct that towards Congress and it's been incredibly um, effective and we're, we're fine tuning it all of the time. And so I think that you know if we work together and we continue to do the education, what we are building is right and good and will change the world and we just need to convey that message um, to policymakers and if we do that um, in a thoughtful way, which doesn't happen overnight, I think we ultimately can get really good policy outcomes. And I see the clock has ended. Thank you all so much. Let's get a round of applause for the panel, concentrating the 20-day topic into 20 minutes. Thank you.